The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, uh, in that case, uh, let's get started. Um, as usual, I'd like to begin by uh, giving a review of what we talked about last time, this time on slides instead of on the blackboard. Uh, we're talking mainly about relativistic energy, or relativistic energy and momentum and pressure at some times. Uh, the key equation is the f probably the most famous equation in physics, uh, Einstein's E equals mc squared. And I gave some numerical examples. I actually looked up some more numbers since then when I was revising the lecture notes. So these are slightly more up to date. But it's still true that uh, if you could burn matter at the rate of one kilogram per hour, uh, you would have about one and a half times the total power output of the world. And that's apparently still valid in 2011. I only had 2008 figures, actually, at the lecture last time. Uh, and uh, if you imagine a 15-gallon tank of gasoline, and you could figure out how much that, what its mass is, and convert that to energy, uh, it turns out that a 15-gallon tank of gasoline could power the world for about two and a half days if you could convert all of it into energy. Uh, the catch, of course, is that we can't convert matter into energy. Uh, we can't get around the problem that, at least at the energies that we deal with, a uh, baryon number, the net number of protons and neutrons, is conserved. So we can't make protons and neutrons disappear. Uh, and that means that uh, we're limited in what we can do. And in particular, uh, one of the most efficient things we can do is, is fission uranium-235. Uh, but when uranium-235 undergoes fission, uh, less than one-tenth of one percent uh, of the mass is actually converted into energy, uh, which is why we can't actually avail ourselves of these fantastic numbers that would uh, apply if we could literally just convert matter into energy. Uh, we went on to talk about the relativistic <coughs> definitions of energy and momentum and how they come together to form a Lorentz 4 vector. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the underlying theme here is, is that we consider ourselves users of special relativity. Uh, most of you, uh, I know, have taken special relativity courses. And for those of you who have, this is a review. Uh, for those of you who have not, and there are some of those also, uh, no need to panic. Uh, I intend to tell you every fact that you need to know about special relativity. I, I won't tell you how to derive them all, uh, but I'll tell you all you'll need to know for this class. Uh, so in particular, it's useful for this class to recognize that energy and momentum can be put together into a four vector, uh, where the zeroth component is the energy divided by the speed of light, and the three spatial components are just the three components of the spatial momentum, although they have to be defined relativistically. Uh, the relativistic definition of momentum, or at least how it relates to velocity, is that it's equal to gamma times the rest mass times the velocity, uh, where gamma is the famous factor that we've been seeing all along when we've talked about relativity, the Lorentz contraction factor, 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Uh, the energy of a particle, relativistically, is the same gamma times m0 times c squared. And it can also be written as the square root of m0 c squared squared plus the momentum squared times c squared. Uh, since the momentum forms a four vector, its Lorentz invariant square should be Lorentz invariant. Uh, and that means that the momentum squared minus p0 squared should be the same in all inertial reference frames. Uh, and that's just equal when you put in what p0 means, the momentum squared minus the energy squared divided by c0 squared. And to know what value it's equal to in all frames, it's efficient to know what it's equal to in one frame. And the one frame where we do know what it's equal to is the rest frame of the particle. So in the rest frame, the momentum vanishes, uh, and the energy is just m0 c squared. Uh, so in the rest frame, we can evaluate this, and we get minus m0 c squared squared. Uh, and that means that that has to be the value in every frame. And this, in fact, is the easiest way to derive the relationship between energy and momentum. If we go back, uh, the equation we had relating energy and momentum is really exactly that equation rearranged. Um, just to give an example of how this works when we actually have energy exchanges, 
I pointed out that we could talk about the energy of a hydrogen atom. And because energy and mass are equivalent, uh, the hydrogen atom clearly has a little bit less energy uh, than an isolated proton plus an isolated electron. Because when you bring them together, there's a binding energy. And that binding energy is called delta E and has a value of 13.6 electron volts for the ground state of hydrogen. Uh, so that tells us the mass of a hydrogen atom is not the sum of the two masses, but rather has this correction factor uh, because we've taken out a little bit of energy uh, for the binding, uh, and that means we've taken out a little bit of mass. OK, then we talked about the mass density of radiation and how building up to how that will affect the universe. And we said that the uh, mass density of radiation is just the energy density divided by c squared. Uh, and that can be taken really as a definition of what we call relativistic mass, and hence relativistic mass density. Uh, but the important point is that this mass density actually does gravitate uh, the same as any other mass density of the same value. It really does create gravity uh, in the same way. Now, I mentioned that things are much more complicated if you want to talk about the gravitational field produced by a single moving particle. Uh, that's asymmetric. The velocity of the particle shows up in the equations that describe the metric surrounding uh, a single moving particle. But if you have a gas of particles um, moving at high velocities, uh, where the velocity is nonetheless averaged to zero, which is what tends to happen in a gas, at least in the rest frame of the gas, um, then um, that gas will produce gravitational fields just like a static mass density, uh, where the mass density is this relativistic energy divided by c squared, the relativistic definition of the mass density. Uh, it's also useful to know uh, that the photon, uh, if we want to describe it as a particle, it's a particle of zero rest mass. Uh, which means that it can never be at rest. It always moves at the speed of light. Uh, and it also means that its energy can be arbitrarily small uh, because the energy is proportional to the momentum, and the momentum of a photon can be as small as you like. Uh, for a given frequency, of course, the energy of a photon is fixed. It's h times nu. Uh, but if you're allowed to vary the frequency, uh, which you can do if you just look at it in different frames, uh, you can make the energy as small as you like. Uh, and the famous equation then, p squared minus e squared c squared, which would have on the right minus m0 squared c to the fourth, um, or m0 squared c squared, excuse me, um, has zero on the right-hand side because m0 is zero. Uh, and that means that for photons, the energy is just the speed of light times the momentum. And that's a famous relationship that photons obey. Uh, now, thinking about how this gas of photons will behave in the universe, uh, we realized immediately uh, that it does not behave the same way as a mass density of ordinary non-relativistic particles, which is what we've been dealing with to date. Uh, the important difference is that in both cases, the number density falls off like 1 over a cubed as the universe expands. These particles are not created and destroyed in significant numbers. They just persevere. Uh, so the number density of either non-relativistic particles or photons just falls off like 1 over the volume as the volume increases and the number density dilutes. Uh, but what makes photons different from non-relativistic particles is that a non-relativistic particle will maintain the energy of that particle as the universe expands. But photons will redshift as the universe expands. So each photon will itself lose energy, and it loses energy proportional to 1 over the scale factor. Uh, and that's just because the frequency shifts uh, proportionally to the scale factor. Um, and that means that the energy per photon shifts, because quantum mechanically we know that the energy of a photon is proportional to its frequency. So if the frequency redshifts, so must the energy in exactly the same way, 1 over A of t. Yes, question? You said previously that What is it about them that make this, make this happen? Because they're, they're also particles with standard kinetic energy, right? OK, the question, in case you didn't hear it, is, is why, 
how do neutrinos fit in here? Uh, I've made the claim that neutrinos act like radiation in the early universe, uh, but neutrinos have a non-zero mass, so they should obey the standard formulas for particles with non-zero masses. Uh, the answer to that is, is, there is, I think, a simple answer, which is that uh, as long as the energy is large compared to the mass, uh, particles with masses will still act like massless particles. Uh, it doesn't really matter if the mass is zero or not. Uh, the key thing really is uh, this equation. Uh, so if the term on the right-hand side is small compared to either of the two on the left, uh, it's not much different from it being zero. And that's what happens for neutrinos in the early universe. And we'll see soon that, that if you go to early enough times, it's true even for electron-positron pairs. Uh, they will also act like radiation. Uh, any particle will act like radiation as long as the energy is large compared to the rest energy. Uh, so getting back to the discussion of the early universe, uh, if the energy of each photon falls off like 1 over the scale factor and the number density falls off like 1 over the scale factor cubed, it means that the energy density, and hence the mass density, of radiation will fall off like 1 over a to the fourth, uh, in contrast to the 1 over a cubed that we found when we were talking about non-relativistic matter. And that, of course, is going to make a difference because those issues played a key role in our discussions about how the universe evolved. Uh, we can, an important feature which we see immediately is that if we extrapolate backwards in, in time, since the radiation mass density is falling off like 1 over a to the fourth, and the matter density is falling off like 1 over a cubed, it means that as you go back in time, the radiation becomes more and more important relative to the matter uh, by a factor of the scale factor. Uh, so if we go back far enough, we will even find a time when the mass density in radiation equaled the mass density in non-relativistic matter. And we calculated about when that would be. Uh, we said that the energy density in non excuse me, in radiation today uh, is given by this number, 7 times 10 to the minus 14 joules per meter cubed. And I just gave you this number. I didn't derive it yet. We will derive it probably later today. Uh, but for now, we're just accepting it. Uh, and that implies uh, we can calculate from that the ratio of the mass densities in radiation and ordinary matter. Uh, here we use the fact that ordinary matter can be described by having an omega, a ratio to the critical density of about 0 0.3. And we know how to calculate the critical density. And that allowed us to calculate the density of ordinary matter. And then this ratio turned out to be 3.1 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, so radiation in today's universe uh, is almost negligible in its contribution to the overall energy balance uh, compared to non-relativistic matter. Uh, but if we extrapolate backwards, uh, we know that this ratio will vary as 1 over the scale factor. And we can figure out what constants to put in this equation uh, by putting in the right constants so that this equation gives us the right value today, where the right value today is 3.1 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, and notice that this works. If we let t be equal to t sub 0, this factor is 1, and we get 3.1 times 10 to the minus 4. So these two factors together, the a of t0 and the 3.1 times 10 to the minus 4, are just the right factors to put in uh, to give us the right constant of proportionality uh, in that equation. Uh, having this equation, we can then ask, how far back do we have to go? Uh, how much do we have to change t uh, for the ratio to be 1? And that's a straightforward calculation. Uh, and the ratio of the a's is then just 1 over 3.1 times 10 to the minus 4, or 3,200. Um, so if we talk about it in terms of a redshift, which is how astronomers always talk about distances or times, uh, we're talking about going back to a redshift of 3,200. Um, we can then figure out what time that corresponds to also if we know how a of t depends on time. And we do, approximately. Uh, for this calculation, I assumed for now, we could do better later, and we will, uh, but I assumed for now that we could just treat the period between matter radiation equality, so-called T ek, and now, uh, as being entirely described by a matter-dominated universe. That's only a crude approximation, but it will get us the right order of magnitude, and we'll learn how to do better later in the course. Uh, so if we assume that, uh, then T ek is just this number to the 3 halves power, canceling the 2 thirds, times the age of the universe, T naught. Uh, and that turned out to be about 75,000 years. 
so somewhere in the range of 100,000 years, 50,000 years, um, is the time in the history of the universe when radiation ceased to be more important than matter. And for earlier times than that, uh, the radiation dominated. And that, that's what we refer to as the radiation dominated era. Any questions? OK, now I think we get on to what is really the important uh, subject that we want to understand. And most of this you did yourself on the homework, uh, but I'll summarize the argument here. Uh, we want to understand what this tells us about the Friedman equations. And first, we'd like to understand what it says about pressure, because it turns out that pressure is the crucial issue in determining how fast rho falls off as A expands. Uh, if rho is proportional to 1 over a cubed, uh, we can just differentiate that, putting in a constant proportionality temporarily just to keep track of what we're doing, since we know how to differentiate equalities and we're less familiar with how to differentiate proportionalities. Uh, but what we find immediately is that rho dot is then minus 3, where that 3 is that 3, times a dot over a times rho. Uh, on the other hand, if rho of t falls like 1 over a to the fourth, rho dot is minus 4 times a dot over a times rho, just by differentiation. Uh, so we get different expressions for rho dot uh, between radiation and matter. And we want to explore the consequences of that difference. Uh, it's related to the pressure of the gas uh, because we can relate the pressure to rho dot. Because we know that as a gas expands, uh, it loses energy, which is just equal in amount to PdV. And we illustrated this by a, a piston thought experiment. Uh, but it's true in general. Uh, so we could apply this famous formula, du equals minus PdV, to a patch of the expanding universe. And by a patch, I mean some fixed region in coordinate space. Uh, so the total energy in that region of coordinate space will be the physical volume, which will be A cubed times the coordinate volume, which is going to cancel out of this equation. It will appear on both sides. Uh, so it's a cubed times the coordinate volume times the energy density, which is rho c, rho c squared. Uh, the rate of change of that is du. And then on the right-hand side, we have minus p, minus p times dv, which is the rate of change of a cubed, again, times the coordinate volume that we're talking about. But that will cancel out on the two sides of the equation. So this is really just the description for the universe of the du equals minus pdv equation. Uh, and this can just be rearranged, expanding the time derivatives, to give us rho dot. And we get minus 3 a dot over a times rho plus p over c squared. Uh, so this tells us how to relate rho dot to the pressure. And it tells us that the formula that we started with a long time ago, uh, which just said that rho fell, fell off like 1 over a cubed, uh, was synonymous with saying the pressure is zero. For a gas of non-relativistic particles, the pressure is negligible. Uh, but for radiation, clearly if we're going to get a 4 instead of a 3, uh, the pressure will be non-negligible. And in fact, it implies that the pressure is exactly equal to one-third of the energy density uh, for a gas of radiation. OK, knowing that, we can now look back at the Friedman equations and ask, how do they stand up? Uh, are they still consistent, or do we have to modify something? And this is really the crucial point. Uh, what we know are these three equations, which are the two Friedman equations and the equation for rho dot. And we could see immediately that those equations are not independent of each other. Uh, the easiest thing to see is that if we start with the top equation, we could differentiate it. And since the top equation has an a dot in it, when we differentiate, we'll get an equation for a double dot. But the equation will also involve rho dot if we take the time derivative of that top equation. But if we know what rho dot is, we can put that in. And in the end, we'll get an equation for a double dot by itself. Uh, and it will, in fact, agree with the equation on the middle line. If it didn't, things would be inconsistent. Things are consistent. We didn't make any mistakes. Uh, if we derive 
the equation for a double dot by using the first and third of those equations, we will get the second of those equations. But the catch is that now we want to modify the third of those equations, the equations for rho dot. Uh, and then the Friedman equations, as we've written them, will not be consistent anymore. Uh, because we'll have a different equation for rho dot, we'll get a different equation for a double dot. Uh, so we have to decide what gives. Uh, what can we change to make everything consistent? And here, the rigorous way of proceeding is to look at general relativity and see what it says. And the answer we're going to write down is exactly what general relativity says. Uh, but we can motivate the answer in, I think, a pretty sensible way uh, by noticing that as the universe expands, uh, we'd expect the energy density to vary continuously because energies are conserved. And we also expect a dot uh, to vary continuously uh, because basically the mechanics of the universe are like Newton's laws, and velocities don't change discontinuously. You can apply a force, and that causes velocities to have a rate of change, but velocities don't change instantaneously unless you somehow apply an infinite force. And the same thing will be true with the universe. On the other hand, accelerations can change instantaneously. Uh, you could change the force acting on a particle in principle as fast as you want, uh, and the acceleration of the particle will change uh, at that same rate. Uh, so if we look at these equations, uh, we would expect that the first equation and the third equation uh, would not be allowed to involve the pressure because the pressure basically is a measure of a force. Uh, pressures can change instantaneously. Um, so uh, what we need to do if we're going to make these equations consistent in the presence of pressure, which changes the rho dot equation, uh, the only equation we could change is the second one. And then we can ask ourselves, what do we have to change it to uh, to make the three equations consistent? And this is what you looked at on your homework. Uh, and the answer is that the a double dot equation has to be modified uh, to give the equation at the bottom of the screen here. And this is the correct form of the a double dot equation in cosmology. And this is what we'll be using for the rest of the term. This is exactly what you would get from general relativity. Uh, as long as we're talking about homogeneous and isotropic universes, uh, this formula is exact as far as we know. OK, any questions about that? Yes? Um, why, when we, we derive that equation, do we, we use uh, this equation? Or the one above that? Yeah. Uh, we use du equals minus pdv. I mean, I agree with that, but couldn't we use a more complete version, like the complete version of the first law of thermodynamics, that du equals tds minus pdv? Um, OK, yeah. The question was, uh, when we wrote down du equals minus pdv, why did we not? include a plus TDS term here, uh, which could also be relevant. Uh, the, the answer is that for the applications we're interested in, you're quite right, it could be important, uh, but for the applications that we're interested in, which is the expanding gas in the universe, uh, the expanding gas in the universe, we will be making use of this fact, uh, really does expand adiabatically. Uh, that is, there's nothing putting heat in or out, uh, and everything is remaining very close to thermal equilibrium which means that entropy does not spontaneously change. So the TDS term we will be assuming is very, very small, and that's accurate. And you're right. If that were not the case, there would be further complications in terms of figuring out what rho dot is. Uh, let me go back here. Um, let me just point out. Um, that this equation actually does contain a somewhat startling, perhaps, fact about gravity. Uh, it says that in the context of general relativity, and that's really the context that we're in, even though we haven't learned a lot of general relativity, uh, but it says that in the context of general relativity, uh, pressures, as well as mass densities, uh, contribute to the gravitational field. A double dot is basically a measure of how fast gravity is slowing down the universe. Uh, and this says that if there's a pressure, it can also help to slow down the universe, meaning that pressure itself can create a gravitational field. Uh, in the early universe, where we go back to this radiation-dominated period, uh, we know that the pressure is one-third of the energy density. That says that this pressure term is the same size exactly as the mass density term. Uh, so in the radiation-dominated phase, the pressure is just as important in effect for slowing down the universe as is the mass density. Uh, in today's universe, it's negligible. Well, 
we'll come back to that. Uh, the dark energy has a non-trivial pressure, but the pressure of ordinary matter in today's universe is negligible. Um, the other important fact about this equation is that energy densities, uh, so far as we know, are always positive. Uh, we, don't, we don't know for sure what the ultimate laws of physics are, but for all the laws of physics that we know, energy densities are positive. Um, on the other hand, pressures uh, actually can be negative for some kinds of material. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to get a negative pressure uh, later. Uh, but this formula tells us that positive pressures act the same way as positive mass densities, creating an attractive gravitational field which slows down the expansion of the universe. Uh, but if there could be a material with a negative pressure, uh, this same equation, which would presumably still hold, and we believe it does, uh, would tell us that that negative pressure would actually cause the universe to accelerate because of its gravitational effects. Now, we're not talking about the mechanical effects of the pressure. Uh, mechanical effects of pressure only show up when there are pressure gradients, when the pressure is uneven. So the very large air pressure in this room, which really is quite large, uh, we don't feel at all because it's acting equally in all directions. Uh, uniform pressures do not produce forces. Um, so the mechanical effects of the pressure in the early universe, which we're assuming is completely homogeneous, uh, is zilch. Uh, there is no mechanical effect. Uh, but what we're seeing in this equation is a gravitational effect caused by the pressure. And it's obviously gravitational because the effect is proportional to Newton's capital G, uh, constant determining the strength of gravity. Uh, so the equation is telling us that a positive pressure creates a gravitational attraction which would cause the universe to slow down in its expansion. Uh, but a negative pressure uh, would produce a gravitational repulsion, uh, which would cause the universe to speed up. Uh, and we now know that today, in fact, for the last five billion years or so, uh, our universe itself is actually accelerating uh, under the influence of something. Uh, and the only explanation we have is that the something that's causing the universe to accelerate is the repulsive gravity caused by some kind of a negative pressure material. Uh, and that negative pressure material is what we call the dark energy. And we'll talk a little more later about what it is. It's very likely just vacuum energy, but we'll come back to that later in the course. Yes? So when, we at, when we looked at the toy example of the piston in the uh, cavity, the pressure of the gas was pushing outwards against the walls of the container. But we can't uh, have that. There's no walls, yeah. right? So how do we, how should we view pressure uh, in this sense then? Okay, uh, yeah, okay, the question um, is in our toy <coughs> problem involving the piston, we had walls for the pressure to push against, uh, and that was where the energy went, it went into pushing the walls. Uh, when we're talking about the universe, there are no walls. Uh, how does that analogy work? What plays the role of the walls? Uh, and the answer, I think, uh, is that the role of the walls, when we're talking about the universe, uh, first of all, you can ignore it if you just look at a small region. You could still just say the small region is pushing out on the region around it. Um, and I think that's enough to make the logic clear, but it still leaves open the question of ultimately where does this energy go? Since saying it goes from here to there it doesn't help you unless you know where it goes after it goes from there and there and there. Uh, so you might want to ask the question more generally, where does the energy ultimately end up? Uh, and then I think the, the answer is that it ends up in gravitational potential energy. Uh, you can certainly build a toy model where you just have a gas in a finite region, uh, self-contained under gravity, and then you'd have to make up some kind of a mechanism to cause it to expand. But when you cause it to expand, you'll be pulling particles apart, which are attracting each other gravitationally, uh, and that means you'll be uh, increasing the gravitational potential energy as you pull the gas apart. Uh, so I think ultimately the answer is uh, the energy imbalance that we seem to be seeing here uh, is taken up by the gravitational field. So that all in all, energy is still conserved. Any other questions? OK, in that case, let us continue on the blackboard. OK, first thing I want to look at is just the behavior of a radiation-dominated flat universe.
So a flat universe is going to obey 8 squared equals 8 pi over 3 g rho, and then the potential minus k c squared over a squared. Hard to draw dotted lines on the blackboard. But this potential term is not there because k equals 0. We're talking about the flat case. So for the flat case, we could just express h in terms of rho. Uh, and we know how rho behaves for radiation. Uh, rho falls off as 1 over a to the fourth. So h squared is proportional to 1 over a to the fourth. Uh, that means that h itself is proportional to 1 over a squared. So we can do that. Uh, a dot over a uh, is equal to some constant over a squared. a dot over a being h. And now we can multiply both sides by a, of course. And we get a dot is equal to a constant over a. And this we can integrate. Uh, the way to integrate is to put all of the a's on one side and all of the dt's on the other side. Uh, so we get a dA, writing this as dA over dt. So a dA is equal to the constant times dt. And then, as we've done before, when we're talking about matter, it's the same calculation now, just a different power of A that appears, so we know how to do it. Uh, integrating, we get 1 half A squared is equal to the constant times T, um, and then plus a new constant of integration, constant prime. Now we make the same argument as we've made in the past. We have not yet said anything that determines how our clocks are going to be set. Uh, so we can choose to set our clocks in the standard way, which is to set our clocks so that t equals 0 corresponds to the moment where a is equal to 0. And if a is going to be equal to 0 when t is equal to 0, it means constant prime is going to be equal to 0. So by choosing the value of constant prime, we really are just determining how we're going to set our clocks how we're going to choose the zero of time. And we'll do that by setting constant prime equal to zero. Uh, and then we get the famous formula for a radiation-dominated universe. A of t is just proportional to the square root of t, or t to the 1 half power. And this is for a radiation-dominated flat universe. replacing the t to the 2 thirds that we have for the matter-dominated flat universe. Uh, once we know that a is proportional to the square root of t, and for the flat universe, the constant proportionality means nothing, by the way. It's not that we haven't been smart enough to figure out what it is. It really has no meaning whatever. You can set it equal to whatever you want, and it just determines your definition of the notch, your definition of how you're going to measure the co-moving coordinate system. Uh, once we know this, we should know pretty much everything. So in particular, we can calculate h, which is a dot over a. Uh, and the constant proportionality drops out when we compute a dot over a, as we expect. It has no meaning, so it should not appear in the equation for anything that does have physical meaning. Uh, so h is just 1 over 2t, the 1 half here coming from differentiating the t to the 1 half power. We can also compute the horizon distance. So the physical horizon distance, L sub p horizon, where p stands for physical, uh, is equal to the scale factor times the coordinate horizon distance. And the coordinate horizon distance is just the total coordinate distance that light could travel from the beginning of the universe. And we know the coordinate velocity of light is c divided by a. 
so we just integrate that to get the total coordinate distance. So it's the integral from 0 to t of c over a of t prime dt prime. And since a of t is just t to the 1 half, uh, this is a trivial integral to do. And the answer is 2 times c times t. So in a radiation-dominated universe, the horizon distance is twice c times t. Uh, for a static universe, the horizon distance would just be c times t. It would just be the distance light can travel in time t, but more complicated in an expanding universe. Uh, for the matter-dominated case, we discovered that the horizon distance was 3 ct, if you remember. Uh, for the radiation-dominated case, it's 2 ct. And finally, uh, an important equation is that going back to here, where we started, uh, this equation relates h to rho. We did found out that merely by knowing the universe is radiation dominated, without even caring about what kind of radiation it is, how much neutrinos, how much photons, whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, merely by knowing the radiation is the universe is radiation dominated, uh, we were able to tell that h is 1 over 2t. And if we know what h is, that formula tells us we also know what rho is. So without even knowing what kind of radiation is contributing, uh, we know that for a radiation dominated universe, rho is just equal to 3 over 32 pi Newton's constant g uh, times time little t squared. It's rather amazing that we can write down that formula without even knowing what kind of radiation it's contributing. But as long as that radiation falls off as 1 over uh, the scale factor to the fourth, and as long as we know the universe is flat, uh, then we know what that energy density has to be. Flatness is crucial here, by the way. The energy density could be anything if we did not assume that the universe was flat. OK, any questions about this? Yes? If we assume that it was almost flat, would we be able to kind of have any bounds on it? Uh, OK, the question is, if we assume that it was almost flat, would we be able to have any bounds on it? Uh, the answer is, yeah. If you were quantitative about what you meant by almost flat, you could, you could get, know how almost true that formula would have to be. OK, if there are no other questions, I want to switch gears slightly now and go back to talk about some of the basic underlying physics uh, that we are going to need. And in particular, the physics of black body radiation. So this is really just a little chapter of a StatMet course. Uh, that we're inserting here because we need it. And because it comes from another course, we're not going to try to do it in complete detail, but I'll try to write down formulas that make sense uh, and that will give us what we need to know uh, to proceed. So that will be the goal. Uh, so uh, what is black body radiation? Uh, the physical phenomenon is that if one imagines a box with a cavity in it, that's supposed to be a box with a cavity in it, in case you can't recognize the picture. Uh, if the box is held at some uniform temperature T, T is temperature, uh, then it is claimed uh, and verified experimentally uh, that the cavity will fill up with radiation. In this case, we're really just talking about electromagnetic radiation. Uh, the cavity will fill up with electromagnetic radiation uh, whose characteristics will be determined solely by that temperature T uh, and will therefore be totally independent of the material that makes up the box. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, I think the way to think about it is to say that the box will fill up with radiation at temperature T. And saying that the radiation has temperature T is enough to completely describe the radiation. It doesn't matter what kind of a box that radiation is sitting in. Uh, so the box will fill with
radiation at temperature T. And that radiation is called black body radiation. Uh, like many things in physics, it has a variety of names just to confuse us all. Uh, so it's also called cavity radiation, which makes a lot of sense given the description we just gave. Uh, and it's also just sometimes called just thermal equilibrium radiation. This is radiation at temperature T. Um, I haven't really justified the word black body radiation yet, so let me try to do that quickly. Uh, the reason why it can be called black body radiation, and this will be important for some things in cosmology, I'm not sure if it will be important to us or not, but it's certainly important to know. Uh, the reason why it's called black body radiation is because we can imagine inserting into this cavity a black body. In the literal sense. Uh, what is the literal sense of a black body? It's a body which is black in the sense that all radiation that hits it is absorbed. Now this black body is still going to glow. If you heat a piece of iron or something to very high temperatures you see a glow. Uh, that glow is not reflection. That glow is emission by the hot atoms in the piece of iron or whatever. Uh, emission is different from reflection. Uh, when we say it absorbs everything, we mean it does not reflect anything, but it will still emit by thermal de-excitation. Uh, the crucial distinction between reflection and thermal emission is that reflection is instantaneous. When a light beam comes in, if it's reflected, it just goes back out instantaneously. Uh, emission, uh, thermal emission, uh, is a slower process. Atoms get excited, and eventually they de-excite and emit radiation. Uh, so it takes time, and that's the distinction. We're going to assume that this body is black in the sense that there's no reflection. OK, now we're going to make use of the fact that we know that thermal equilibrium works. That is, if you let any isolated system sit long enough, uh, it will approach a unique state of thermal equilibrium uh, determined by its constituents, which you put in to begin with, um, but otherwise independent of how exactly you arrange those constituents. Uh, so if we put in, for example, a cold black body, it would start to get hotter, warming up to the same temperature as everything else. If we put in an extra hot black body, it would emit energy and start to cool down to the temperature of everything else. Uh, but eventually, uh, this black body will be at the same temperature as everything else. And we're going to be assuming here that the box itself is being held at some fixed temperature, T. Uh, so wherever energy exchange occurs because of this black body, it will be absorbed by whatever is holding the outer box at the fixed temperature. So in the end, if we wait long enough, this black body is going to acquire the same temperature as everything else and hold that temperature. Now, if it's holding that temperature, it means that the energy input to the box, to the black body, will have to be the same as the energy output of the black body. Now, the black body is going to be absorbing radiation, because we have radiation here, and we said that any radiation that hits it is absorbed. That was the definition of black. Uh, so it's clearly absorbing energy. Uh, if it's not going to be heating up, and we know that it's not because it's in thermal equilibrium, the energy temperature will remain fixed, in order for it to not heat up, it has to radiate energy as well. And the energy it radiates has to be exactly the same as the energy it's absorbing once it reaches thermal equilibrium. So in equilibrium, The black body, BB, radiates at the same rate that it absorbs energy.
So you know, this radiation process is this slow process of thermal emission. There are atoms inside this black body that are excited. Uh, those atoms will de-excite over time, releasing photons that will go off. Uh, and the important thing about that slow mechanism is that if we imagine taking this black body out of its cavity, but not waiting long enough for its temperature to change, so we're going to assume its temperature is still the same T, So this is a picture of the same black body at temperature T, but now outside the cavity. Its radiation rate is not going to change when we take it outside the cavity, because the radiation was caused by things happening inside the black body, uh, which are not changed when we put it in or out of the cavity. So it will continue to radiate at exactly the same rate that it was radiating when it was in the cavity. And that means it's going to radiate at exactly the same rate uh, as the energy that would absorb if it were bathed by this black body radiation. So essentially, it means it will emit black body radiation with exactly the intensity that the black body ra radiation would have on the outside uh, if the black body were still inside the cavity. So it radiates with exactly the same intensity as the energy that it would receive uh, if we're inside the cavity. And furthermore, um, you could even make, elaborate a bit on this argument to show that the radiation that it radiates has exactly the same spectrum, uh, exactly the same decomposition into wavelengths as the black body radiation inside the cavity. And the way to see that is to imagine surrounding this black body uh, by um, by absorption filters that only let through certain frequencies. And the point is that no matter what frequencies you limit going through this filter, uh, you have to stay in equilibrium. It will never get hotter or colder. So that means that each frequency by itself has to balance, has to have exactly the same emission uh, as it would have absorption if the black body were just exposed to black body radiation surrounding it. So it radiates black body radiation, and the intensity and spectrum must match what we call black body or cavity radiation. So the cavity radiation has to exactly mimic the radiation emitted by this black body, and that's the motivation for calling it black body radiation. Now, if this black body absorbed some radiation and reflected some, then it would emit different radiation. So it is important that this body be black in the sense that it doesn't reflect anything. Uh, all radiation hitting it uh, is absorbed. And only under that assumption do we know exactly what it's going to emit. Yes? Well, we'll start to cool after you take it out. And, and as it cools, its temperature will change. But if you account for the changing temperature, it will be true at any time, actually. But the temperature will change. Because like, in the black cavity, it has things exciting it. And when you take it out, there's like, no photons, to, like, no constant radiation to excite it. So um, uh, yes, once you take it out, it's no longer being excited. And I think, uh, technically, you're right. If, if, uh, once you take it out, it will not only cool, but it will cease to be at a uniform temperature. Um, and that's basically what, it, what, what we're saying if we're saying that the atoms that are excited won't necessarily be in the right thermal distribution uh, as they would be if it was on the inside. That would be a statement that's not any longer in thermal equilibrium. But as long as the radiation is slow, you could just account for the change in temperature, and you, and you would know how it radiates. And I think that's a very good approximation. So in principle, it will cease to be in thermal equilibrium as soon as you take it out. And the, edges will be cool and the center will be hot and uh, you'd have to take into account all of those things to be able to understand how it radiates. Any other questions? Okay, next I want to talk a little bit about what this black body radiation is. 
Uh, and one can begin by trying to understand it purely classically, which of course is what happened historically in the 1800s. Uh, people tried to understand cavity radiation or black body radiation using classical physics, Maxwell's equations, to describe the radiation. Uh, and then, in a nutshell, we're just trying to establish basic ideas here. Uh, one can try to treat a field um, statistical mechanically uh, by imagining not fields in empty space, but fields in some kind of a box. In this case, it doesn't necessarily have to be the cavity that we're talking about. It could be a big box that just encloses the system somehow to make it easier to talk about. In the end, you can imagine taking that box to infinity, this theoretical box that you use to simplify the problem. But once you put the system in a box, then a field, like the electromagnetic field, can always be broken up into normal modes. Uh, standing wave patterns that have an integer or a half integer number of wavelengths inside the box. Uh, and no matter how complicated the field is inside the box, you could always describe it uh, as a superposition of some set of standing waves. In general, it takes an infinite number of standing wave components to describe an arbitrary field. Uh, that is, with shorter and shorter wavelengths. Uh, but you can always, and this is Fourier's theorem, uh, you can always uh, describe an arbitrary field in terms of these standing waves. Um, and that's good for the point of view of thinking about statistical mechanics, because you can think about each standing wave almost as if it were a particle. Uh, it really is a harmonic oscillator. So if you think you know the statistical mechanics of harmonic oscillators, each standing wave in the box is just a harmonic oscillator. So simple, uh, we now try to ask what is the thermodynamics of this system of harmonic oscillators. Uh, and the rule for harmonic oscillator is, is simple. Uh, StatMac tells you that you have 1 half kT uh, per degree of freedom in thermal equilibrium. The energy of a system should just be 1 half kT per degree of freedom. Having said that, all the complicated questions come about by asking yourself what is meant by a degree of freedom. Uh, but for the harmonic oscillator, that has a simple answer. Uh, a harmonic oscillator has two degrees of freedom, the kinetic energy and the potential energy. Uh, so the energy of a harmonic oscillator should just be kT per degree of freedom. And we could apply that to our gas in the box. And we could ask, how much energy should the gas absorb at a given temperature? Uh, what should be the energy density of the gas at a given temperature, this gas of photons? But it was noticed in the, 1900, in the, uh, the 1800s uh, <laughs> that this doesn't work uh, because there's no limit to how short the wavelengths can be. And therefore, there's not just some finite set of harmonic oscillators. There's an infinite set of harmonic oscillators uh, where you have more and more harmonic oscillators at shorter and shorter wavelengths uh, ad infinitum, no limit. Uh, and that came to be known as Gene's paradox. So what it suggests is that if this classical StatMac worked, which obviously is not working, but if it did work, it would mean that as you tried to put a gas, just an empty box, in contact with something at a fixed temperature, uh, the box would absorb more and more energy without limit, uh, and uh, ultimately would presumably cause the temperature of the whatever is trying to maintain the temperature to go to zero uh, as energy gets siphoned off to shorter and shorter wavelengths of excitations. Uh, that obviously isn't the way the world behaves. We'd all freeze to death if it did. 
Uh, so something has to happen to save it, and it wasn't at all obvious for many years what it was that saves it. Uh, but this genes paradox turns out to be saved by quantum mechanics. And the important implication of quantum mechanics is that the energy of a harmonic oscillator is no longer allowed to have any possible value, uh, but is now quantized as some integer times h times nu, the frequency. h being Planck's constant, nu being frequency, n being some integer. Well, this integer might be called the excitation level of the harmonic oscillator. Depending on how you choose your zero, you might have an n plus a half there. Uh, but that's not important for us right now. It will be important later, actually. Uh, but for now, we'll just allow ourselves to readjust the zero and just think of it as n times h, h nu, or h bar omega. Now, this makes all the difference statistical mechanically. Well, one can apply statistical mechanics using basically the same principles to the quantum mechanical system. Uh, and the key thing now is that for the very short wavelengths, which are the ones that were giving us trouble, the infinities came from short wavelengths, uh, for the short wavelengths where nu is high, uh, h nu is high. And it means that there is a minimum ante that you can put in to excite those short wavelength harmonic oscillators, and it's a large number. You either put in a large amount of energy or none at all. Quantum mechanics doesn't let you do anything in between. Uh, now remember, the classical mechanics answer was that you'd have kT in each harmonic oscillator. And kT would be small compared to h nu if we're talking about a very short wavelength. So the classical answer is just not allowed by quantum mechanics. Uh, you either have to put in nothing or an amount much, much larger than the classical answer. Uh, and when you do the statistical mechanics quantum mechanically, which is not a big deal really, uh, you find that when you're confronted with that choice, the most likely answer is to put in no energy at all. Uh, so quantum mechanics freezes out uh, the short wavelength modes, uh, and in the end produces a finite energy density for a gas of photons. Yes? Um, you're saying, isn't there also a divergence at the large wavelength end? Right. Uh, no, that's, that's important. Um, the, um, the reason that's not a problem is that if you're talking about the energy in a box, the wavelength can't be bigger than the box. The largest possible wavelength is twice the box, so that half a wavelength fits in the box. Uh, if you're talking about the energy in the whole infinite universe, then you expect the answer to be infinite, and it is. There's no problem with having an infinite total energy if you want to have a finite energy density throughout an infinite universe. Uh, so the size of the box cuts off the large wavelengths, uh, and quantum mechanics cuts off the small wavelengths. So in the end, one does get a finite answer for the energy density of black body radiation. And that's crucial for, crucial for our survival. Uh, crucial for the existence of the universe as we know it, and also crucial for the calculations that we're about to do. Okay, so. When one does these calculations for, initially for photons only, Uh, what one finds is that the energy density uh, is equal to a fudge factor, which I'm going to call g. And you'll see later why I'm introducing a fudge factor. For now, g is just 2. Uh, but later, we'll generalize the application of this formula, and g will have different values. Uh, but for now, we're dealing with photons. There's a factor of 2 there, but I'm going to write 2 as g, writing g equals 2 underneath. Uh, and then pi squared over 30, you can really calculate this, uh, times k t 
to the fourth power divided by h bar c cubed, h bar being Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, and little k being Boltzmann's constant. So this is calculated just by thinking of the gas in a box as a lot of harmonic oscillators and applying st standard stat mech to each harmonic oscillator, but you apply the quantum mechanical version of the stat mech to each harmonic oscillator. And you can also find by doing the same kind of analysis that the pressure is one third the energy density, which we also derived earlier by different means. And it's all consistent, so you get the same answer every time, even if you think about it differently. So here I have in mind deriving it directly from the stat mach. You can also, from the stat mach, calculate the number density of photons in thermal equilibrium. And that will be equal to, again, there's a factor of 2, but this time I'm going to call the factor of 2 g star, where g star also equals 2 for photons. But when we generalize these formulas, g will not necessarily equal g star, which is why I'm giving it two different names. Uh, and this g star multiplies zeta of 3 where zeta refers to the Riemann zeta function, which I'll define in a second, uh, divided by pi squared times kt cubed divided by h bar c cubed. Okay. Okay, so I need to find this zeta of 3. It's 1 over 1 cubed plus 1 over 2 cubed plus 1 over 3 cubed plus dot, dot, dot. It's an infinite series. And if you sum up that infinite series, at least the three decimal places, it's 1.202. Okay, and then there's one other formula that will be of interest to us, and that will be a formula for the entropy density. Now, if you've had a step mech course, you have some idea of what entropy density means. If you have not, um, suffice it to say for this class uh, that it is some measure of the disorder in the sense of the total number of different quantum states that contribute to a given macroscopic description, the more different macro state, the more different microstates there are that contribute to a macroscopic description, the higher the entropy. Uh, and the other important thing about entropy to us, besides that vague definition, which will, will, will be enough, but the important thing for us is that under most circumstances, entropy will be conserved. Uh, it's conserved as long as things stay at or near thermal equilibrium. And in the early universe, as the universe expands, that's the case. Uh, so for us, the entropy of our gas will simply be a conserved quantity that we can make use of, and we will make use of it in some important ways. Uh, we can write down a formula for the entropy density of photons, and it's G, where this G is in fact the same G as over there. It is related to the energy, so it's the same G that appears in the two cases. Uh, two in both cases for photons by themselves. Uh, and then there are factors that you can calculate. 2 pi squared over 45 uh, times k to the fourth t cubed over h bar c cubed. Okay, this time the number of k's and t's do not match. 
That's mainly due to conventions about how entropy is defined. It's not really anything deep. Uh, might mention at this point that the twos that I've been writing for everything, g equals two, g star equals two, uh, the reason those twos are written explicitly rather than just absorbing the factor of two into the other factors is that photons are characterized by the fact that there are two polarizations of photons. So if I have a beam of photons, they could be right-handed or left-handed, and anything else could be considered a superposition of those two. Uh, so there are two independent polarizations, and it's useful to keep track of these formulas as the amount of energy density per polarization, because different kinds of particles will have different numbers of polarizations. So if we know the amount per, per polarization, we'll be able to more easily apply it to other particles. Yes? Uh, sorry, just to kind of bring up the same question. If we, uh, I read that as in the early universe, the temperature is constantly changing or it's cooling. Right. So then if the temperature is changing, then how, is, how can we say that the entropy is constant? Okay, important question. We'll be getting to it very soon, but you, since you asked the question, I'll ask it now. The question was, uh, if the universe is expanding and the entropy density is going down because it thins, uh, how can that happen? Uh, I guess it was asked the other way around. Uh, if the temperature is falling, how can entropy be conserved if this is the formula for entropy density? Uh, and the answer, uh, when I tell you, you'll see it's obvious. Um, we don't expect the entropy density be, to be conserved if the entropy is conserved. The entropy thins out as the universe expands. So if we just had a gas with nothing else changing, uh, we expect the entropy density to go down like one over uh, the scale factor cubed, just like the number density of particles. Uh, so if S is going to go down like one over the scale factor cubed, that would be consistent with this formula if the temperature also fell as one over the scale factor, so that cubing it made things match. And that's what we'll find. The temperature falls off like one over the scale factor. And that's consistent with everything that we said about energy densities and so on. OK, next thing I want to talk about is neutrinos, which I told you earlier uh, contributes in a n significant way to the radiation energy density in the universe today. Okay, neutrinos are particles which for a long time were thought to be massless uh, until around 2000 or so. Neutrinos were thought to be massless. Now we know that, in fact, they have a very small mass, which complicates the description here. It turns out that cosmologically, neutrinos still act as if they were massless for almost all purposes, and for really all purposes that we'll be dealing with in this class. Although if we were interested in the effects of neutrinos on structure formation, uh, we, we'd be interested in whether or not the neutrinos have a small mass or whether it's smaller than that. Uh, we know it's non-zero. Uh, we don't know what the neutrino mass is, by the way. What we actually know uh, from observations is that there are three types of neutrinos, and those are called flavors. I now use the letter nu for the word neutrino. Um, and those three types of neutrinos are called nu sub e called the electron neutrino, nu sub mu, called the muon neutrino, and nu sub tau, called the tau neutrino. Uh, and these letters, e, mu, and tau, uh, link to the names of particles. This is the electron neutrino. This is the muon neutrino connected to a particle called the muon, which is like the electron, but heavier but, and different. Uh, and this is linked to a particle called the tau, uh, which is also like the electron, but much more heavier, um, but otherwise similar in its properties. And the neutrinos are linked in the sense that when a neutrino is produced, uh, depending on how you start, it is very typically produced in conjunction with uh, one of these other particles. So a, an electron neutrino is typically produced uh, in conjunction with an electron. Uh, And similarly, a muon neutrino is typically produced in conjunction with a muon, and a tau neutrino is typically produced in conjunction with a tau.
Now, what does this have to do with neutrino masses? We've never actually measured the mass of a neutrino. So we only know that they have mass indirectly. Uh, what we have seen is one flavor of neutrino turn into another flavor. And it turns out in the context of quantum field theory, and I think this does make a certain amount of sense just by intuition, if a particle is massless, it can never change into anything. Uh, the process by which one changes into another is pretty quantum mechanical and a little hard to understand anyway. Um, but if the particles were really massless, they would move at the speed of light. And if the particles were moving at the speed of light, if the particle had any kind of a clock on the particle, uh, that clock would literally stop with the particle moving at the speed of light. Uh, so if particles are massless, uh, any internal workings that that particle might have uh, have to be frozen. That is, if it's a clock, it has to be a clock that stopped completely. Uh, and for reasons that are essentially that, although they can be made more formal and more rigorous, uh, a truly massless particle could never undergo any kind of change whatever. It would have to stay exactly like it looks like to start with, because it just has no time. Uh, so the fact that these neutrinos turn into each other uh, implies that they must have a non-zero mass. They must not really be moving at quite the speed of light. Uh, and that's the way the formalism works. And we could set limits on the masses uh, based on what we know about the transitions between one kind of neutrino and another. Yes? Uh, how do we explain like, photon decay to electron positron pairs? A photon decaying to an electron positron pair? Yeah. Uh, the answer is a free photon never does decay to an electron-positron pair. Photons can collide with something and produce an electron-positron pair. But, but in that collision, it, it, that's a more complicated process. Uh, what I'm saying is, uh, I'm sorry, this, th this process of conversion, maybe I should have clarified, happens just as the neutrinos travel. It's not due to collisions. Due to collisions, complicated things can happen, um, whether the particle is massless or not. Um, but a massless particle simply in transit, cannot undergo any kind of transition. And these neutrinos are seen to undergo transitions simply being in transit without any collisions. In terms of my clock analogy and the stop clock, I think the reason the photon can convert into electron positron pairs if it collides with something is that when it collides, it essentially breaks the clock. Uh, you, don't, you don't have a photon that's just moving along uh, without time anymore. OK, so these neutrinos have masses. And maybe I should, at this point, write down some bounds on these masses. Um, m squared 2, 1 times c to the fourth uh, is equal to 7.50. Uh, plus or minus 0 0.20 times 10 to the minus 5 electron volts squared. These numbers come from the latest particle data group tables, which I gave references for in the notes. So this is a, the difference of the mass squared. And delta m 2, 3 squared times c to the fourth, turn it into a square of an energy, uh, is 2.32 plus 0 0.12 minus 0 0.08 times 10 to the minus third electron volts squared. So one thing you notice immediately is that these are incredibly small masses. Uh, you know, the, remember, the proton weighs 938 uh, MeV, million electron volts. And these are fractions of one electron volt. So by the standards of particle physics, these are unbelievably small energies, uh, unbelievably small mass differences. Uh, but they're there. They have to be there for the physics we know to make sense. Uh, the other thing that you may notice about this notation, which I don't want to elaborate on, but I'll just mention, uh, this is called 2, 1, this is called 2, 3. There's no 1, 2, or 3 there. There's an E and a mu and a tau. Um, the complication here is something very quantum mechanical. Uh, the, uh, new, the E, mu, and tau labels uh, are labels which 
basically label the neutrino according to how the neutrino is created. Uh, it turns out that their mass eigenstates, states which actually have a definite mass, uh, are not the E, the mu, or the tau. In fact, if the E had a definite mass, that would be saying that an E would just propagate as a particle with a certain mass. It would not convert into anything else. Uh, the fact that an E converts into other particles, a nu sub E converts into other particles, is really the statement that nu sub E is not a state with a definite mass. Uh, but there are states with definite masses which can be expressed quantum mechanically as superpositions of these flavor eigenstates. So nu sub 1, nu sub 2, and nu sub 3 are states of neutrinos that have definite masses, uh, and each one of them is a superposition of nu sub e, nu sub mu, and nu sub tau. Yes? Uh, good question. I think it's just the lack of knowledge. Uh, I, I don't think there's any reason why it's not defined. I'm, I'm sure it is defined. Uh, I think it is just lack of knowledge. And if I knew more details about how these things were measured, I could give you a better story about that, but I don't, frankly. So in the end, it's a rather complicated quantum mechanical system, which we're not going to go into any details about. Um, what more should I say today? OK, let me just mention uh, for today, and we'll continue next time after the quiz, uh, for our purposes, we're going to treat these neutrinos as if they're massless. And it turns out that that's actually extraordinarily accurate from the point of view of cosmology, at least for the kind of cosmology that we're doing, where we're just interested in the effect of these neutrinos on the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, and treating them as massless particles, uh, I will shortly give you the formulas for how they contribute to the black body radiation. But I think there's no point in my writing them now. I'll just write them again at the end of next, beginning of next period. Uh, but they do contribute to the black body radiation in a way that we actually know how to calculate. Um, and they have a noticeable effect on the evolution of our universe. OK, that's all for today. Uh, good luck on the quiz on Thursday. I'll be here to help Proctor. Uh, I think Ching Tao will be here too. Uh, and I'll see you more intimately either at my office hour tomorrow or at lecture a week from now.